All right, so I think I might do the intro like as part of this rather than just picking up a random intro, but we'll see, we'll Give me see one how sec. it goes. See how it goes. Are you ready, Summer? Just need a quick emergency sip. Yeah, let's go. Hello, Summer. Hello, Jake. You've seen this before. I don't, don't I know it? Yep, this is the HTML spec. This is this is the full version of the spec. This ah, is the 12 eight megabyte? megabytes. 12. Wow. 12 now. They keep adding to it, it turns out. Oh, damn. Um, I actually measured how high this is. Uh, this is <laughs> 1.7 million pixels high at this rough size. It's a big document. It's pretty big document. Got a lot of APIs to cover. Yes, it takes ages to fully load, and it is janky all of the time that it's loading. Uh, the bottleneck here is layout. And you can see from this uh, bit of uh, Chrome DevTools here, it takes over 50 seconds worth of layout, and that is on a high-end MacBook Pro. So yeah, you know, don't do that on, on a phone. On an Android Go phone, that's going to take it will, it will melt through the table, and uh, you'll never see it again. Melt straight through to the core of the Earth and will kill us all. So definitely don't do that. But what if I told you, with less than five minutes of effort, I made it into 400 milliseconds, 50 seconds down to 400 milliseconds. Two orders of magnitude less. Is that right? Yes. I think so. Yes, I suppose it is. And I didn't cheat. I didn't delete anything. I actually added <laughs> some stuff. Um, I didn't break Control and F or Command and F, like searching in the document. I didn't break linking. I didn't break SEO. Um, and I didn't even write any JavaScript. And I'm going to show you how I did that. So, OK, all I did to achieve this is some minor HTML changes and a little bit of CSS, uh, specifically these two bits of CSS, which are new in Chrome 85. Mm -hmm. And it's um, only in Chromium browsers right now, uh, but the changes I made don't break things in other browsers. Uh, they just don't get the optimization. And so you're just applying this to whatever, because the HTML spec totally uses whatever. I will show you the correct class name I used in a minute. Steady right. on. Fine. I could have used whatever, because I don't think it uses whatever already in the HTML spec. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but before I tell you the class name I did use, that can be the uh, that's the hook that's going to keep everyone, isn't it? Like They're <laughs> eager to see what class name I actually used. It's going to be disappointing. Uh, but before we go into <laughs> detail, I'm going to show you a little, a little bit of background. The browser tries to be smart Like when it displays a page. It doesn't paint everything. Like it just paints the stuff you can see. It seems like a pretty sensible assumption. Yeah, it's great, and that means like it saves loads of CPU, GPU, and memory by just painting stuff as you get to it uh, in the viewport as you scroll up and down the document. But in order to figure out what's inside the viewport, it needs to know the layout of the page. And CSS is great, right? You can do anything in CSS. Uh, one of the things you can do is take something that's right at the end of the document and make it appear at the very top. Um, you can take something which is nested in 100 divs or elements or whatever, and you can move it outside of those elements. So generally, you need to do all of the layout before the painting, um, even if like even if you figure out that a box is completely outside the viewport, it doesn't mean that you can make any assumptions about the children inside that box. And so you, yeah. Exactly. Yes, it's difficult to lay out just a, a small bit of the document. Until now, <laughs> we have a solution for it now. Um, here's the HTML spec in terms of like how it looks uh, in terms of HTML. It's pretty flat. It's a pretty flat document. Uh, there are 22 H2 headings. Um, here's the, the bit you wanted to know, so I mean, you wanted to know that class name. Here it comes. Um, I wrapped each section in an element and gave it a class. There it is. Enjoy it. Um, and that's all I did. And of course, I used a regular expression to do this because it's a quick hack, but it worked. <laughs> so it's are you fine. saying you passed HTML with regex? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. I just searched for those start headings and those end headings, and I did a I did the start and the end tag at the same time, and then just went and deleted the first end tag because it doesn't have. Yeah, you know, it's easy, it's fine, it's okay, <laughs> it's a hack, but it works. And that's the important thing. And then it's the the CSS. 
what I added is content visibility auto. This is one of those new bits. And what this says, this says the, it's like a declaration that says the, the inner layout of this element can be deferred until this is in the viewport, until the, the parent element's in the viewport. And that comes with a few restrictions. It I wish they called it deferred now. Content visibility is deferred. Yes, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because we already have deferred for scripts and things like that. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> or actually, for things that enter the viewport, we call it lazy. So I guess it would be content visibility lazy. That'll also be good. I like it. If we're going to have a spec meeting now, let's do it. Let's, <laughs> let's change the whole thing. Let's unship it. We'll fix it. We'll fix that one word. OK, yeah, fair enough. The word is auto that, that it shipped with. Um, and yeah, that comes with some restrictions. It means you can't paint outside the element, uh, which you'll be familiar with if you've used Overflow Hidden before. And it also means that layout can't escape the element. So you know, CSS has collapsing margins. This means you can't use those. It's, but that's like that's position. That's Overflow Hidden as well. Yeah. So by me, the developer saying I'm giving this element content visibility auto, I'm basically opting in or guaranteeing that. There is no escaping elements that would make you know these layout calculations actually difficult. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, so that means that if if this parent element is going to be at the end of the document, that declaration means that the browser knows that something inside it can't you know drift its way to the top of the document and be in the viewport where, when the parent isn't. So yeah, that that's the sort of guarantee that you give the browser, and it enforces that. Uh, very similar to Overflow Hidden. Um, this often leaves the element at zero height, like the height of an element with no children elements. Um, and that's a problem, because that means all of our sections are going to scroll into view at the same time, because they're all just stacked on top of each other, zero height, uh, which is not good, because that means they're all going to lay out at the same time. So to work around that. Because now they're back in view with zero pixel. Ah, OK. Yes, this is contain intrinsic size, which I don't know. It's it's a, it's a mouthful. Difficult one to remember because I always think the first word is content because the other thing is content. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What this lets you do is set the width and height of the the content of the element while the layout is deferred. So it's like a fallback width and height. But you are setting the size of the content, not the element. And this is something that took me a while to get my head around. So it's as if it has a single child element of this size. Well, that would only make a difference when you have padding, right? Otherwise, it would be the same. No, no. So it's different in this case, because I've I've given it a inner width of one pixel there. But it's still going to be mm -hmm. a full width element, because that's how block level layout works. Because it's display block. Right. OK. So that's why I put one pixel in there. I thought, well, oh, it doesn't matter. And for the heights, I I just guessed. Like, I, it was the, the biggest number I could think of at the time. <laughs> so I just put that in. <laughs> It really it doesn't matter much because it's just a fallback. Because so when it does the proper layout, it's not going to use those numbers anymore. It will give it the, the correct number. All right. So you basically let's say you start at the at the start of the HTML spec, and you have like the table of contents in view. That means all the actual top level sections will be empty boxes with a height of five thousand outside of the viewport, and the browser can skip layouting all the actual children because you said you know what don't don't bother just assume that once you laid out the children, one pixel by 5,000 pixel is a result. And though now when you, when you scroll towards the next upcoming section, that's where the browser goes, wait, this is now actually very close to the viewport. I'm going to do the actual layout, but just for this one following box, which might mean that this section could be larger or smaller than this one pixel by 5,000 pixel, right? Yes. Yeah, the actual layout could be, yeah, it could go either way. So could that cause problems? The, there is one side effect of that, and I will come to it in a minute. But largely, no, it's, it's OK. Um, but yes, like you're saying, the browser can keep the layout really, really simple. Uh, and it is until like, the user starts scrolling, and then it goes, oh, I'm going to add that more layout, because they're getting close to that element. Um, and it just defers all of that work. But yeah, that's literally all I did. Uh, with the HTML spec, just those small changes. And that is what took the, the layout time of the spec from 
50 seconds down to uh, 400 milliseconds, like 0.6% of the original. And like I said, doesn't break Control and F. That still works. That's a big deal because I know th this is, it reminds me a bit of infinite scrollers, where, for example, Twitter has these things where you have the tweets in the viewport and a couple of tweets outside either end. When you start scrolling, the things at the top will get recycled to be reused at the, do at the bottom to keep your DOM count low and keep layout costs low. Um, but those implementations are A, JavaScript driven, and B, break control F, which I've run into, like where you try to find a tweet you just saw on your timeline, but because it's scrolled out of the view and has since then been recycled, control F won't find it anymore. Exactly. Yeah, I've, I've run into that too. Um, when you do control F on the HTML spec demo I built for this, it's, it's a slowdown uh, because you need, when you do control F, you're not just searching the markup. You're not even just searching the text in the document. It depends on, oh, it depends on style calculation. It might depend on some layout as well. So it has to go and do a lot of that. And it can do it in phases. It can do it deferred a bit. But to tell you how many matches there are in a document, it's going to have to go and do a lot more work than it would do if you were just regular scrolling. But it works, and that's the important thing. Um, and it doesn't break linking either. If you link to an element that's inside one of these deferred layout things, it will figure it out, or, or at least it will soon. Uh, in the making of this demo, I found a bug with that. I filed it, and it's been fixed. So, you know, you know maybe by the time this episode goes out, it'll all be oh, that's actually it's actually an interesting point though, because you know things like display none will affect Control F and other things as well. That style calculations will still affect the entire document and will become more expensive the bigger your document is. Yeah. It's layout. It's really a really I say to layout that gets cheaper with content visibility. Is that yes. right? And he, yes, it's just layout. Layout's the only thing it, it saves. But yeah, with searching for text, um, you can have two elements which are right next to each other in the source. Like there's no space between them. But because they're both block level, there is, you know, as far as humans are concerned, a line break between them um, that isn't in the source. Whereas if those two were in line, then you know, there's no space between them. So yeah, there's a lot of layout information that you need to, to think of to, to actually effectively search for text in the document. But yeah, it's all just taken care of, which is which is great. Here's a live demo. Now you were asking me what's the, you know, what might be the problem with me just putting 5,000 as, as the box size. Um, watch the scroll bar in the top right. Uh, so as I scroll down, there's a little jump there. Uh, the, the scroll bar jumped down. And as I scroll further and further and further, eventually get to another section, and it's, it jumps up. And this is it switching from its imagined fallback layout to its actual layout. And it has to adjust the scroll bar to, to cater for that. But that happens on uh, mobile platforms already for the same reasons. Like You guess the height of certain elements, and the scroll bar moves around and adjusts itself uh, as it figures stuff out. I think it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's really a question how much scroll bar consistency or inconsistency in this case is a big deal because infant scrollers have the same problem to an extent, and I guess I guess it becomes a lot weirder when you load a page with an anchor that you start in the middle of the document and you scroll up and the scroll bar jumps back down. I guess, but I guess it still works if you click and drag. It doesn't break clicking and dragging the scroll bar itself. That still works. It probably behaves a bit weird, but it should still work. Yeah, it, it still jumps around, uh, but the it doesn't break the mouse interaction. It just looks a bit weird. But yeah, that already happens on you know on mobile platforms. One other thing in that that demo, I don't know if you noticed though for the uh, Hangouts call we're on now, but the uh, there was a bit where it, it there was a flash of white. Well, not a flash of white. It scrolled into a white area, and it took a while for it to draw a bit. And that's because one of like I said, there's only 12 headings in this massive document. So I only have 12 sections. And so I scrolled into an area where it actually had to do quite a lot of layout work um, to be able to render it. And you could see that. I could fix this by just making smaller chunks. So that's one thing to think of as a developer with this is like the number of chunks, like more is generally better. Like if you have too many at the start, then you increase the upfront layout work where it figures out where all those chunks are. Um, but if you have too few, then you risk that thing where like scrolling to a particular area is still going to be quite expensive. Uh, another effect? Could you nest content visibility? So you have, you know, you have the top level H2s that are now all 
content visibility auto with their intrinsic size. Could you now apply the same mechanism to the H3 heading so that the stuff inside the H2 in itself, again, uses content visibility to create those smaller chunks? Yes, you can do that. And it all Great. just works. Um, but that's why it's complicated. And that's why we had a bug when it came to linking to a specific anchor through the document, because like it knows that anchor is inside this box. So it scrolls to that box, but then it has to lay out. And then it realizes, oh, no, that anchor is now somewhere else. So it scrolls again. And then it might have to relay out because of all of these boxes becoming visible that weren't visible before. And that's the bit that we hadn't done. Like That's the bug we had, is we were only scrolling to the fallback box. And it was it was the okay. initial position, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Another nice effect for this, uh, this is time resizing. So resizing here is super smooth because there's not a lot of layout work to do. Uh, so it's nice and quick, and that'll be quick on mobile, desktop, like you know. Um, if we compare it to the real HTML spec, and this is an extreme example, but it's taking like over 10 seconds sometimes to figure out the new layout for the new width, it really lags behind. I mean, you say it's an extreme example, but using this big a document on a fast machine like you're using is probably somewhat representative of a normal-ish document on a low-end phone, where you go from portrait to landscape. Like That could still happen, and there would still be benefits to making those operations faster. Yes, yeah. And even in some cases, uh, you know, popping open a keyboard in and out is going to change the viewport size to, to some extent. Um, so yeah, th this is an extreme example, but you know, have a look at your site and have a look at the layout time. And if you're hitting, you know, a large-ish layout time, I'm not saying like 50 seconds. If you have three seconds of layout time, and if a lot of that is content that's out of view of the viewport, then it's a quick win right here. You know, and you might not even have to change any of your HTML because you might have those sections all boxed up already. So you're just adding like two lines of CSS. And you can knock like seconds off your layout. Even if you're knocking just a few milliseconds off, it's almost free to do it. So yeah, I, I, it's we've had sort of CSS containment stuff in the browser for years. You've been able to do some of this stuff, but it's been such a lot of manual work. But now, a couple of lines of CSS, job done. I actually would love to see this in more like blog templates just built in by default, where this seems to be like the perfect application, which is when, when you have a lot, lot of text po content, potentially, just don't lay out the stuff out of view. It's magic. It's great. Yeah, and not just blogs. Like We see particularly new sites that have like, lots of, uh, especially on their home pages, lots of complicated layout stuff going on. Quick win right there. Right there, free performance. And that's all I've got. Well, thank you, Jake. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> It's been a pleasure and an honor. <laughs>